introduce you to the first of our wonderful three panellists, which is Justine. So, Justine, this talk will take it away, please. Hey, everyone. I'm so impressed with the turnout. Thank you for coming to see us. Um, I'm Justine, or I'm Hart. If you know me from Aiden, my name is Hart. I'm the admin there, and I've been a, a moderator for quite some time as well. Um, I thought to start this off, I would start with something super basic, and I wanted to talk to you about relationship styles. So we all are familiar with the traditional relationship. Sometimes people call it the relationship escalator. The reason they do that is because there's defined steps that have an order, and you're supposed to always be going up with them. Right? So you meet for coffee first, um, then you, you date for some time, then you have the relationship talk, you call it a relationship. Right? You take those steps, eventually maybe you become engaged, get married, buy a house with a white picket fence, get a kid. Um, when I give this talk, this is usually when I joke that the house with a white picket fence is a complete joke because I'm from Vancouver and we have a housing crisis. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's the relationship escalator. Most people are familiar with it. Most cultures have it in some form or other. I just described my culture's version of the relationship escalator. But it exists in most cultures. The idea is you're always going up those steps. There's usually some defined amount of time. You can go too fast or you can go too slow. Um, and you're never taking a step back, or you're never getting off unless you break up with that relationship. Um, what I want to say is that the queer community brings so much to this dialogue. We, we can bring different relationship styles to this. We can break that societal script. While it works for some people, it doesn't, it's not a one-size-fits-all like it's sold to us as. So what I want to talk about is spectra. In relationships, there is so many different axes. You can mix and match and choose and where you want to be on each of these spectra. There's the sexual to non-sexual. There's romantic to non-romantic. There's committed to not committed. So some relationships may not be sexual or romantic, but you're committed to each other in a lifelong manner. So this is talking about queer platonic relationships, which I think are going to be mentioned a little bit more later, where you go through all of those steps, of do things with a partner that would traditionally be reserved for sexual or romantic partners, like buying a house together, maybe raising a kid together, having a joint financial bank account. These things are typically reserved for your one partner that's sexual or monogamous, but they don't have to be. And that's the beautiful thing about queer relationships, is we can break these scripts and make our own of them. So myself, I'm far on the polyamorous side of the spectrum. I have two wonderful partners right now, a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Um, and each of those relationships is unique on where it is on the other spectrum. So whether it's romantic or not romantic, um, I'm not a sexual person, I'm ace. Um, so I could strain that on that front. Uh, <laughs> but what I want, in, I'm interested in talking about here, and what I'm interested in and love to hear from you guys, is how we can take the relationship script that Hollywood gives us, rip it apart, and form what we want form what we feel most comfortable in and express affection best through. So to me, I express affection best in a polyamorous setting. That's not for everybody. And even among polyamorous settings, there are many different ways of doing this. Um, some people express affection best through words, through actions, through kink, through sex, through romance, um, through commitment, right? So I'm very interested in having this dialogue with you guys and exploring how we can take relationships and make them Hours. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sandra Bellamy. I'm author of Asexual Perspectives, founder of Asexualize.com, and founder of Asexualize Academy, which is the world's first online training centre for asexuals and asexuality. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things today, um, all to do with relationships. One is about relationships in general. Um, obviously, you've got the aromantic asexuals that experience no romantic attraction and no sexual attraction and then you've got the romantics that are really wanting a romantic relationship usually going through to the great asexuals and demisexuals who um, do experience some sexual attraction usually under limited or rare or specific circumstances in terms of great asexuals and with the demisexuals they experience sexual attraction when they, a strong emotional bond has been formed so with all these different types of asexuals it makes uh, getting a suitable relationship really, really hard. If you're uh, looking online, it's like, where do you go? And I get asked this question a lot. So there are asexual dating sites out there, if you don't already know about them. Uh, one of them is ace-book.net. Um, um, that is an online dating site and social networking site for asexuals. And also asexualitic.com, 
I'm on both of those, um, and that the asexualistic.com is um, a yearly fee. But one of the um, biggest um, problems with asexual relationships is, although we are asexual, we've all got that thing in common. We've all got those different things that we like and don't like, different hobbies, different interests, and um, you know, some of us um, want marriage, some of us uh, want children in other ways. So it's like, how do you solve that problem? But when you're on asexual dating sites and on the asexual um, dating scene, or even if you're just looking for a really um, strong friendship, you know, when you're on these sites, you have to be um, really specific about what you want. So people are like, oh, if you're too um, narrowed down, like how you find someone, it's not about that. It's about being true and authentic to who you are, working out what hobbies and interests you've got and how you can, you know, get someone compatible in that way. Physicalities come into it. Some people are touch at first, for example. They can't have any touching in a relationship. Some people uh, do like some touching. Some people like kissing. Some people don't. So you need to be on these sites being your true thing itself, saying who you really are and expressing yourself and what you really want. And there are asexual dating groups as well on Facebook. I run two. I run the asexual, uh, grey asexual and demisexual dating group and the asexual, uh, what's called asexualized um, dating group, which is for people who don't want sex at all, specifically for those who don't want sex. And I also run an asexual friends group. So if you are aromantic, asexual, and you just want friendship, then I've got that there. So I want you to know that it doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum, that you can still find someone for a relationship. You know, don't give up. It does take a while. Um, the other thing I want to cover today as well is the most important thing is to love yourself. You know, asexuals can get very lonely. They can feel depressed and isolated and like no one cares. And some of them will spend hours on their own inside because they don't know any other way of communicating. And it's really important, you know, you can get out to asexual meetups, which I'm doing a talk about that afterwards. It's one way of meeting other people to form friendship and also possible relationship. Um, but you can also do something called self-dating. And people, when I talk about that, are like, what on earth self-dating? I've never heard of it before. And I'm like, well, that's basically when you have um, what you would normally do in a relationship with someone. So say you like going to the cinema or out for meals or you're like having a movie day um, with your boyfriend, girlfriend or queer platonic other. Um, then you, instead of doing that with them, you would do it by yourself. So you would go out um, and take yourself out for meals to the cinema so you do everything you would normally do in a relationship, but you do that on your own, because if you do that on your own, it empowers you and it makes you feel so good and it puts you deep in touch with your soul so that you don't need a person so much, you don't need all the external stuff, you can get love just from yourself. And people are like, well, what do you do on these self-dates, you know? They're like, huh, that sounds really weird. I'm like, well, I go out to theme parks, I go out to zoos, and like, this is one of the places I went to recently, which is Green Leisure Park, um, it's absolutely amazing. I have the whole day to myself. I just went on loads of theme parks. I love superhero stuff. It's amazing. So I was just totally in my zone. And the good thing about self-dating is you always get a good date because you do what you love. And it's like, yeah, I don't have to sit down and watch two hours of film, which is really no good for me. And it's because the other half chose it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just coming along for the ride. So, you know, you can eat as much food as you want. You know, um, you can do whatever you want. And that's what's really good. So um, I'm just going to show you some of the sides that I do for my self-dating. So if you want to put, so that's a theme park I went to. I watched the Shitty Show as well. I don't know if you've ever seen the Shitty Show. It's like a real kid stuff. But I love kid stuff and I can be myself, obviously. And so the Shitty Show was great. There was this guy on with the Shitty Show. I just want you to know that it's okay to be as young or as old as you feel like. Because we've got all these stereotypes, haven't we, where you have to be a certain age or a certain thing. And you don't have to be that. Obviously, um, Justine was talking about not fitting the norm. And you can do that with yourself as well. You self-love and self-date. Some people are like, I can't do that. People will think I'm weird. I'm sat by myself and I'm eating this candlelit dinner or whatever I'm doing. And they'll be like, no, but it's you. You don't care what people think. Don't have to fit the norm. You don't have to fit into society. Just be yourself and love yourself. So, um, yeah, so you can just pass the other slides on. Just show. So another thing I do is go to the aquarium. I absolutely adore the aquarium. It makes me feel really sort of peaceful and calm. And I love the pretty fishes. I think they're so cute. So yeah, that's another thing that I do. And then if you want to... So I also eat out. Um, I've just been with my friends to Nando's. Um, but I also eat out on my own in Nando's. I'm like a VIP in there. I go so much and self-date there. And you should go out to the cinema as well afterwards. So if you pay the other side, you can see... Like this is me. I've been to see Black Panther, right? And um, I founded International Celebrate Being Single Day in 2015, so that no um, person, sorry, international, yeah, International Celebrate Being Single Day, that's on February the 14th, 
So that basically, <laughs> for reason to check, yeah, same day as Valentine's Day. So basically, every year I go and celebrate being single on February the 14th. So it's like my own special self-dating day. And so I go out, and this is what I bought. I bought myself some lovely sparkly love hearts because I love sparkly things. I'm a sparkly girl. And then I took myself out as well to see Black Panther. So it was absolutely incredible. And I'm like, this is great. Just adrenaline rush. So good. Yeah, and then um, pass on the next one. Yeah, this is the final slide. And I buy myself gifts as well. So this is so cute. It's a bear. And it says, I love you. And I've got this by my bedside table. So whenever I wake up in the morning, I'm saying to myself every single day, I love you. And that's what I'd like you to take away from today as well, is that I'd like you to go around and say, I love me. You know, I love me just for who I am. And I think that's so important, you know. So thank you very much. lovely third panelist. I'm just going to ask everybody that can, that can lead an aisle seat, maybe you can move in, because I know we've got a couple people who came in at the end and don't have a seat. I'll take a moment to shuffle around and let everybody sit down. student from Belgium, so excuse my French, I'm not, I've got an accent. Uh, so I identify as uh, asexual, aromantic, uh, since like two years. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about, about my personal experience. So uh, I didn't know I was aromantic until like really recently, but when I look back, I realized that it was like so clear since I was really little. So I had like my perfect relationship when I was between eight and 12 years old. I had a boyfriend that I saw like two hours a week at court. <laughs> it was like perfect, no expectation, eight years old, so it's fine. Um, but then when I was 16, I started uh, dating and I did like what I was talking about, like I took this uh, escalator. So we started as friends, we had like, we, let, we liked both mangas. And so a week after we knew each other, everyone was like, oh, they're gonna end up together. So it was like written and a year after we started going out together, and then, well, okay, it was a friend, I loved him, it was fine, I said, that's how it's supposed to be. So we started dating, and it was fine. But then when we started wanting to go uh, further, and then it was not okay with me, so the, the relationship broke up because I was like really anxious and uh, sick all the time. And then we broke up, and it was really just me saying him, uh, telling him, well, sorry, it's not you, it's me. So it's really, I think a lot of people maybe have had that. And it's really a shady thing to say, but because I didn't know uh, about asexuality, I couldn't really tell him. And two years after, I just went on the internet. I don't know, I was, I was bored and just kind of typed, mm -hmm. uh, don't want sex and whatever. And so I was like, oh, I'm asexual. And then you're like, why the heck didn't I look up at that three years ago? It's like just stupid, just look stuff on the internet. And so it is actually the, the first people I, can, uh, I came out to. And... Uh, Soon after, I realized actually I was uh, a romantic because I wasn't really looking for a relationship. I was mostly happy because, uh, well, it was a good friend. So uh, I think uh, Justine was talking about a different uh, queer platonic relationship. I'm personally not looking for a relationship, but I know some people are like um, platonic relationship, which is, I think, more like a, a strong friendship bond. So I don't know if like, some of the people in the audience are in that case and want to share about it. So, yeah, that's about it. Thank you to all three of you. So as mentioned, this is a discussion. A discussion does not happen without discussees. I don't know if that's a word, but that's you guys if it is a word. So does anyone have anything they want to share? Anything they want to ask? Any thoughts, even if it's something as simple as I like pizza, who doesn't like pizza, that's the thing. <laughs> so just stick your hand up and ask a question. Yes, you at the back. Uh, this isn't a, a question, but really meant sort of a comment about something. Um, one term that people may or may not have heard of is the term pupil romantic, which is basically people who are aromantic but are still interested in the romantic relationship, even if they're not romantically attracted to either. Uh, they want to be in a relationship with. Um, and this is um, 
Um, I know that there's been, online there was a bit of debate a few years ago, is this real, is this harming the community? Um, that, that's died down a bit as far as I saw, but um, this is more just people may not be aware of that term. It may be a useful term for some people. Um, just, just to let you know, I've done a video about that, and that is covered in my course as well. So yeah, so um, in my course, I don't know if you've grabbed a leaflet when you first came in, because I've got a free asexuality um, course uh, through asexualizeacademy.com, and I even discuss some of the aromantic um, spectrum in there and the different variations within it, and that includes grey romantic and cupio romantic. I actually knew a guy who was cupio romantic, so I know it exists. And I don't like this fact when people say, does it exist or doesn't it? If there's someone who believes that they are it and it makes sense and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it exists. If you exist, then it exists. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise, it's kind of like some people don't believe asexuals exist. But we do exist because we're sat here. So because I've had a friend who was it and he explained it what it was to me as well, I, I know they do exist. So, yeah, I have got that um, covered in a, a YouTube channel on asexualized my asexual life as well that I did to explain the term and what it is, because I do think it needs more visibility as well, because I have seen there's some controversy online, but kind of, if anyone watches my channel, I'm a bit controversial sometimes anyway, because I tackle some taboo subjects, and I'm not really afraid of saying it like it is. So yeah, thank you so much for bringing it up, I really appreciate that. Is there anybody else? Uh, sorry, I saw this hand first, and then maybe we'll go over there. Um, so one time, I was talking with a couple friends who are also LGBTQ, and one of them, a very close friend of mine, said that they would never feel comfortable dating an asexual person because they would feel bad for the person because uh, they wouldn't want to have sex with the person. And like, even if they did have sex uh, with, with an ace partner, they would feel like, it, like they, it, they, they just basically said they would never date an ace person because they would, not because the ace person wouldn't have sex, but because they would feel bad about uh, still wanting sex, even though they're dating an ace person, regardless of whether or not they did in the relationship. I definitely have things to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a reason when I speak about relationships, I tend to not use orientation words, so I tend not to use asexual relationship or things like that, and I think part of that is because your sexual orientation does not dictate your actions or even what you're going to enjoy. Um, and a large, large part of mixed orientation relationships, or of relationships as a whole, is negotiating that area in which you both feel comfortable giving and receiving affection. Um, and everybody, even if you have two sexuals in a relationship, there's different areas that they're going to feel comfortable giving affection and receiving affection. Um, one of the biggest examples I bring up is, if I meet somebody that says that, I'm like, would you date a kinkster? Are, are you kinky? And if their answer is, I am not kinky, but I wouldn't mind dating somebody who was, because why not? Um, my answer is, I, I think that that's a very similar scenario. Um, there are, obviously, we all here know asexuals, there are asexuals that enjoy sex. There are asexuals that will have sex, even if they don't intrinsically want it or enjoy it, for the benefit of their partner, and that's what makes it enjoyable to them. Um, there are others, more like myself, who just are sex repulsed and don't do sex at all. But honestly, one of my partners is sexual, and we have found ways of being affectionate with each other that are pleasurable to us both, that don't fit traditional definitions of sex, because that's not what I want. Um, but I, I find that wherever I haven't encountered that attitude, it usually, or it, every time I've encountered it, it's because it's being conflated with orientation and behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unfortunate. You, you encounter that a lot, and it becomes very tiring to keep having to confront that. But slowly, slowly we'll turn the world around. I, I know many couples, both gay and straight, and I'm sure many of us do, where the relationship started off being sexual, and it no longer is. It's that companionship. Um, so I think but it seems like that sexual part was a needed precursor to get to that close companionship stage. So. In the absence of that, does anyone have any thoughts on how to actually get to that stage? I'm not sure if I'm doing it here. Anyone have any thoughts? Go to the zoo! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go to the zoo. Going to the zoo is awesome, but I see this person here also has a suggestion. 
I've actually had a lot of luck with my previous relationships in completely failing to properly communicate with my partners. Um, <laughs> I have to admit, um, recently I've started to address that, and I've been very clear with, with prospective boyfriends um, that I am asexual, or at least have a very low libido, because I'm still not entirely sure where I fall on the asexual scale. If I'm demi gray or fully asexual, I'm still figuring that out. But I make it very clear to my, my partners that um, if they are going to date me long term, they can't expect a lot of sex, if any at all. Um, and a lot of them have been surprisingly receptive to this. So I guess the best advice I can give, personally, is to tell them, as weird as that may sound, um, if you just tell people that they can't expect a lot of sex, a lot of them will be surprised to open to this. One of my um, partners has suggested that we have an open relationship where he's affectionate with me, but goes out to other people for sex. Uh, considering he's in the BDSM scene and likes to be tied up and whipped, I'm okay with that, because that's also what I want to do. Um, so, I mean, if you ask, you shall receive, but you'll miss all the shots you don't take. Anyone else? I think part of the trick is also to stop thinking about sex as the sort of ultimate intimacy, because a lot of people have this assumption or have this thought that if two people can't have sex, then they can't be intimate with each other, and then they can't get to the other intimate parts of a relationship. They can't get to that emotional closeness if they can't have the physical closeness of penetrative sex. And as someone who has been emotionally, I, I can say that if you just get past that idea that sex is a sort of other ultimate form of relationship embodiment, you can get to a place where you can be, have this companionship with someone. And so I think it depends on the the people, but it's finding some other way, whether it's watching movies together and then talking about all the things you love about those movies, or whether it's other forms of physical affection that aren't sex, or if it's whatever works for the people in that relationship, I think that that's sort of how you have to do it. And it may not be as easy as sort of starting with sex and figuring things out from there as seems to work for a lot of other people. But I think that that's why you talk to each other, um, and if you can talk to each other and find what it is, then what you'll get to later will be better because you've already worked through sort of how do we get to know each other instead of just sort of trying the thing that everyone tries to try and then the thing that it comes out after that. Okay, I think we have time for one more on this topic, and then I think we may have to move on. I'm Dave, person over here. Um, hi, um, people were talking about um, having discussions with partners, prospective partners, which is really limiting. I think the question I have, I have is, how do you get to that point? Because I, 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 I haven't dated in my mind, and I, I tried Tinder last year, and people have like, rejected me for being open about my sexuality, they told me I should be use, using dating apps. And I, I found that really hard to deal with. I mean, how, how do you initiate those, how do you start those conversations to begin with? Um, do, you, do you hide your sexuality? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to review that then. This is going to be music forever. I am so sorry that you had that experience. First off, that was tough to deal with, um, and I can see it. Uh, I think dating apps in general can have audiences, and, and there, there are differences between them. One I've had good success with is OkCupid. Okay um, I have found one partner through there, not one that I'm still with, unfortunately, but it, it was a good partnership that lasted a year, and I, it was great while it, while it lasted. Um, I have found in general that, especially on dating apps, just being upfront eliminates a lot of the people that I shouldn't have bothered with in the first place. Mm. Not because they're bad people, just because sex is important to them, and that's perfectly fine and legitimate. Um, the, the longest relationships that I've had, my, the two that I'm in right now, are four and a half and four years long, respectively, have always started from a place of friendship where we have stupid long discussions about what asexuality means. 
or in one case, one of my partners is ace herself as well. But I have always found that there's a lot of attrition there. So, so when you are upfront about your sexuality before starting to date, there will be many, many, many people who just say no. Um, in many cases, it's a legitimate incompatibility. Uh, some sexual people can't have emotional intimacy, intimacy without sex, and that's not a reflection on them, it's not a reflection on you, it's a style of relationship that's incompatible. Um, there will be many, many, many people who say no because they don't understand what asexuality is, or they think it's something different. It can be hard to tell the difference between those two, and it's tough to deal with, to, to know that some people are not wanting to date you just because they think that you're celibate, or they think that you're something else. Um, ultimately, though, I have found that the ones that do make it through that phase, you, you do get good relationships out of those. Um, and I'm very sorry about the attrition rate. Right? Hello, um, did you know there's a asexual dating app out now called ASAP? I have, I'm not having much luck with those things. I identify as gay as well. So okay. The, the so ASAP is an online dating app and social networking app for asexuals and you download it to go on Android phone or iPhone. Uh, I'll just warn you that there are some people on there that are not actually asexual, surprise, surprise, you do get them. Um, so, you know, personally with me, I don't, I can't ever have sex again, I'm sex repulsed these days, even though I've had sex in the past, so I just eliminate all the dating sites that have got uh, sexuals, or other people call them allosexuals, I just call them sexuals on them because I don't want to be in a relationship that's not suitable for me. I'm fiercely monogamous, so I'm not going to share. So, you know, I only go on the asexual dating sites, asexual app, and I'm in asexual dating Facebook groups, I run two of my own, and I go out to asexual meetups. And anyone who comes along in my life, even if they're, you know, I don't know they're asexual, I'm really upfront, and I'll just say, oh, hi, I'm Sandra, and I shortly get into the conversation, I'm a heteromantic asexual. Or I start talking about asexuality, bring it up, ran, you know, randomly, like I do. That's my personality, so I get away with it, I guess. I'm um, in the first five minutes of talking to someone. Hello, stranger. Yeah, I do asexual stuff online. <laughs> so yeah, it, you've got to work out what your boundaries are. Work out whether you, you know, if you're going on dating sites that predominantly got people who want sex on them, if you're not comfortable in having sex and you don't ever want it, then I would suggest not being on them and look towards being on the asexual dating sites the asexual app and going to asexual meetups across the UK. I've got a friend and he came to an asexual meetup that I did in Exeter and he lived in London and it inspired him to go to lots of other meetups and he went up to another meetup in the UK, all over the UK about once every week, a different meetup around the country. So about three months and he's now with an asexual girlfriend that's a love of his life and he couldn't be happier. So you can get asexual love. And I've seen a lot of homo um, romantic guys, for example, on asexuality. So I like younger foreign guys, but predominantly, when I go on the dating sites, they're homo romantic. So I'm like, I lucked out. They're not going to be attracted to me unless I change what I look like and I like what I look like. So yeah, so don't give up hope. That's what I'm saying. Stick to what you actually want and be very, very bold and brave. And just tell people up front, you know, you don't want a, a sexual relationship. And that's it. And if they can't, you know, like that, if they can't be faithful to you if you want monogamy, then, you know, go to people who can give you that. I was just going to say, I think, as, as Sandra was speaking, one last thing that comes to mind is not everybody is lucky enough to live in a, a liberal place like I do. So if you don't feel comfortable bringing asexuality up right away, that's, that's very, very valid and legitimate as well. Um, and bringing it up when you feel comfortable and safe doing so is a very valid thing. And actually, just to add to that, and to what Sandra said, I wouldn't give up her, not going to talk about how I destroyed the relationship, but how the relationship started was effectively uneven. Someone sent me a message saying, hey, I like your profile, do you want to be friends? It then turns out we lived five minutes away from each other, so in hindsight we could have run into each other. But hey, I actually have a question for Avicia, if she doesn't mind. I mean, it's unconscious you're sort of sitting there looking at me occasionally. Which is, um, you mentioned you're not particularly interested in queer platonic relationships. I wonder, how do people generally react to you and sort of your style of relationships generally? If you don't mind answering that question. Uh, sorry, I didn't really get to the <laughs> question. Um, what style of relationship I, I just, do you like? I just, I, you don't want a relationship, do you? Yeah, so 
I don't even have like so that might help me. So sometimes people find it weird. Well, I find it really hard to explain to people that I don't wish to have a relationship. I mean, I have friends and I have a cat and I'm really happy. <laughs> and I usually come out more easily as asexual to people. And I don't really come out as aromantic because uh, when I told my mom I was asexual, she got it. But then she was like, but you know you can still have someone. You, you don't need to be like so sad. And then I was just like, do I need to tell her that like I'm happy? I don't need a relationship because even if you don't want sex, it's supposed to be something like you need to want the uh, intimacy and something like that. But I just don't wish for a relationship. How do you tell people that you're a sex repulse? Because it, it's really difficult to say to people, I, I'm asexual and they say, I do not like sex. And like, yes, I think it's gross and lame and awful. That's just my opinion. I'm very positive about other people having sex, just not me. I don't, I don't get it. So how do you... How do you just come out to people that you don't enjoy it and will never be in that kind of position? So, just did you mean telling people you want to go out with that you have sex with both? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I saw the boyfriend I was with, I didn't really need to tell him after because, well, I mean, I was so anxious, like, I nearly threw up on him, like, one, more than once, but I don't really know how you would bring it to, like, a, a partner. Just, if you tell him, uh, I don't want to have sex and it's really a no-go for me, if the person doesn't get it and like try to push you, I, I know like if you really love the person it could be really difficult, but I wouldn't be able to be in a relationship where someone would like push sex into me because it's really not something I would be able, just able to do. So. I'm, I'm so I've had sex in the past, but I'm actually a sex repulsed asexual these days because I had it because I thought I had to and that was the norm and expected of me. And then in 2014, I, could, I decided I was dating sexual guys, but the sexual energy from them just became too much. I couldn't date anymore. I was nearly wetting myself, to be quite honest with you, which is a bit big thing to say in front of loads of people. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, it was so hard. I used to be in the toilet all the time on the dates mostly. And I used to be thinking, you know, they're really going to want sex at the end of the night. And um, I dated this Bangladesh guy. 21 years old, very good looking, but um, <laughs> best kiss ever, but when I, after our date, he, he wanted sex, and I told him, I just said I don't like, I think I use the word I don't like sex, because that's when I first found out I was asexual, I wasn't so confident, but I mean nowadays I just tell someone, I mean I don't tend to even date or remotely go get interested in that, but I did actually, because if anyone's got my asexual perspectives book, there's someone in it who's with a bisexual, they're asexual, they're with a bisexual, and they said the sex didn't matter, so I'm thinking, ha, it's given me a little bit of hope that maybe I can find someone. So last year I did date a heterosexual guy for two, two months and we never had sex and he didn't even see me nude because I'm naked repulsed, which there's not many asexuals like that, although my friend is over here. Um, so yeah, um, but you know, and I told him I'm naked repulsed, so you're not going to see me naked. And I just kept my clothes on the whole time I was kissing him and stuff. And the only thing you can do is be yourself in life. Life is so short and I cannot emphasise this enough. This is why I tell people... I, you know, I'm very blunt, I tell people very quickly things because I think if you waste your time and energy on someone who can never give you what you want, so if you want a relationship and you never want sex, that's something that's essential to who you are and your being, so you really need to be upfront with them and if they're going to want that, they're not going to be the right person for you, they're not going to give the love to you that you want, that you need and that you deserve. You deserve love without sex and people can be loved without sex and, you know, I'm going to make sure that if I get a relationship, it's going to have no sex in it. Otherwise, I'm going to be happily single for the rest of my life. So I think I have maybe a slightly different uh, approach here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always found that to be an ongoing conversation. I've never had that in one go. I've never told somebody, hey, I'm sex repulsed, and then have that be the end of the conversation. Um, to me, sex is like any other form of int intimacy in a relationship, and I say that heavy with meaning. Um, it, it is, there are other forms of intimacy that can be just as emotionally evocative, um, just as bonding, just as amazing, frankly. <laughs> and so, as with all other forms of intimacy, I treat sex like a negotiation. Um, I have my boundaries. I'm not negotiating where those boundaries are. They are there. 
and we will not go past them, but what the negotiation is, is it involves a, a long conversation to describe where those boundaries are, to describe what are hard boundaries, what are soft boundaries. Um, I borrow this terminology from the BDS, BDSM community back home. Um, ironically, I, I find it easier to communicate with them often because they're used to explaining themselves. And, and so have, communicating with them, I, I can understand a little bit more about what they're talking about. Your average straight sexual person is not as used to having to explain themselves. But in any case, uh, uh, my hard boundary, I refer to as something that I will never want to cross. It is there, it's a line in the sand. If we go past that, that means you've gone past my consent and that's no longer good. Um, a soft boundary would be something like, well, I, I don't think I would like that. We can renegotiate, or we can talk about it again later. Or maybe we can explore, but be careful around that. I, I don't think I would enjoy it, but it's not, it's not acknowledged. And it could become a hard boundary later. It could be mean that I was getting myself all worked up over nothing. Um, but sexual intimacy or physical intimacy or intimacy of any form, I approach slowly and cautiously uh, because it is an emotionally related thing and everybody can make mistakes and everybody's going to make mistakes. And what's important is approaching that as a spectrum, as a wishy-washy thing that needs to be communicated. And when you do mistakes, make mistakes, to take a pause, take a step back, and make sure you're taking care of yourself and your partner. It's always going to be an exploration. Um, and I found sometimes it takes years to, to negotiate those boundaries and to figure out where exactly I am most comfortable that is also pleasurable to my partner. And that's just the way it is for me. I'm interested to hear from people who are in relationships that are necessarily standard or what's expected, how they communicate those to other people, what kind of reactions they've had. Um, so for example, I was in a relationship for 13 years, during which I realized I was asexual, and we broke up, but basically only as far as we communicated it to other people, so our relationship didn't really change. We're not sure how to communicate how important we are to other people who don't necessarily understand that in the context of non-sexual relationships, mm -hmm. I'm interested in other people's um, experiences. Would anyone like to share? I can speak to that. Yeah. I thought you would. I thought I was about the audience. <laughs> <laughs> My short answer is I've given up giving, or I've given up trying to be perfect on that. Um, I'm polyamorous, I have two partners. A lot of people will look at me and be like, but you're ace, why do you need two partners? <laughs> <laughs> I need them because I'm greedy. <laughs> um, which, I'm just playing off with more poly stereotypes there, sorry. Uh, what I do, the line that I take, is I will say something once, I will say it as true as it, I can express it, and then I'll move on. So I tell people, these two people are very, very important to me. I love them. They are my partners. Um, I consider them my family. And then if they, don't have, if they don't understand at that point, that's fine. I don't need other people to intimately understand my relationships. I just need them to know that these are important to me. Um, and if there is somebody that doesn't respect that, then I have to question whether this is somebody I need in my life. Because if they're not going to respect when I say a truth about myself, I don't know if there's somebody that I need around. Um, and I've found that a very effective method so far. Did anybody else? Oh. Hi. Um, I just thought it was really useful in terms of your discussion about hard and soft boundaries. And I think maybe they apply to identities as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think that everyone has a clear understanding of who they are in terms of where they would fit into which category and I think that's okay and I think that's important to discuss and also be open to others to explore that and the discussions mm -hmm. um, especially as we get with the dating apps really setting an expectation of but I told you everything this is what I was expecting that's what you were expecting and I've seen a lot of people get together and be really disappointed because they thought they had signed up for something and it wasn't they didn't mm -hmm. receive it Whereas those negotiations are really important. I've always treated labels as a convenient shorthand for communicating complex concepts. They are a single word that somehow tries to encapsulate an entire lived experience. It's not going to work perfectly. And it's never going to work perfectly. A label that fits you, that feels comfortable, no matter how comfortable it feels, is still a shorthand. 
That should always be descriptive, not prescriptive. In fact, sorry, I can't read your... Stephanie? We have another person that has a comment on this. Yeah, I, I too am uh, a polyamorous person, not in any relationships at the moment. But one thing that coming to terms with being polyamorous, I've learned is how it is so important to keep conversations going, not only at the beginning, but during any relationship, so that there are no mistakes. Everybody knows where everybody's going, the limits are defined, you can be, if you're not sure about a limit, or it's something you haven't thought about, you can talk to each other, be open and honest. And I think if you can't do that, then any relationship is going to struggle. Thank you. I think we probably have time for one more question, we're going to for very quick. So does anyone have any questions, thoughts, ideas, anything they want to share? Thank you, because I was worried that was going to end more than <laughs> together it's really awesome and they're both romantic asexuals they're so in love they're actually beautiful so yeah that's what I mean but he you have to be proactive not reactive and put yourself out there on asexual dating sites and groups and go and meet people offline you know it's a huge thing and it helps so my girlfriend's gonna kill me <laughs> but she is the most lovely wonderful person she's a superhero in my life um, I am known for being far too flattering of her, but every single word I say is true. <laughs> <laughs> My boyfriend as well, I love. I, I tease him less, and he teases me back less, but I have two wonderful love stories. I, I currently call them my family, and that's not a mistake. Um, I consider them life partners. I've been together with them for four and four and a half years, and we are planning our lives together. Um, my girlfriend is asexual, so that's our story is one of an asexual asexual relationship. My boyfriend is sexual, but of the particular variety where sex is not required for him for intimacy, so he can get sex elsewhere. Um, and and we're we're so happy. We're deeply in love. Um, I'm deeply deeply lucky to have these two wonderful people in my life. I don't know what I did to deserve it, but I need to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for other love stories? We have approximately one to two minutes. Does anybody have a one to two minute love story? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ju just to add, um, I mean, I've personally met quite a few asexuals who are in very happy relationships. Clearly they decided they are in such happy relationships, they didn't need to be here. That is an error judgment on their part. But on the whole, I think there are a lot of happy love stories out there, but people don't necessarily need, feel the need to sort of publicise them or come to aid conferences. But idiots, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have approximately one to two minutes. Okay, it's good. <laughs> um, it's, it's not actually my story, but um, I don't think that we that bothered if I share it here because they were sharing it out there to everyone. He's got a book about his wedding, okay. his ace wedding that he had, which is really lovely, and I think he met on Facebook, is what he said, so, and he shared his whole story, so, sweet to see about, <laughs> uh, about his uh, lovely wedding, and I think his husband's here as well, so. Yeah. They used to be on Pieces of Ace, yeah, that's yes, who, who, who you know them from, if you watched um, the YouTube channel Piece of Ace, which is finished now, um, they, they um, were talking about getting married in there, and they got married before the whole show ended, so, yeah. They live in Bristol as well. Yeah, they're an amazing couple. Yeah.